UFC 255. We got two title fights on this card. First, we got a couple of flyaways, 125 pounders, and uh, the champ Figueredo is facing off against number four ranked Alex Perez coming up from Dana White Contender Series. And we also got for our co-main, of course, Valentina Shevchenko, the champion of the women's flyweight division, 125 pounds as well, versus number three, Jennifer Maya out of a shoot to box in Brazil. Man, we got a hell of a card on our hands. I say that just about every weekend, but the UFC has been doing a great job, man. So uh, let me introduce my co-host, AJ. AJ, how you living, man? You excited for the fights this weekend or what? Man, I'm living well out here, man. Things might be uh, down in society, but you know, we doing good. We still staying strong, man. I'm really excited for this fight. It's kind of a sleeper card, kind of in the general UFC population, but I'm really excited for this one. There's a reason it's a pay-per-view, Derek, and I'm excited to break it down. Exactly, exactly, man. So before we get into all of that, we got to do our due diligence and talk about what happened last weekend, right? So um, to be honest, man, that card kind of got tore up. UFC Vegas 14, it, it got a lot of cancellation. So out of our sleepers, AJ, we started off with six, ended up with only four because two of those fights got canceled. We did have un uh, unanimous decisions across the boards. There was some good fights, but not too many finishes. So we'll take it, man. But I do have to really quickly eat my words because we'll do it every time. I will talk a big talk, but I will always eat my words if I'm wrong. I said Corey McKenna did not belong in the same octagon as Kay Hansen. Well, she proved me wrong, man. She's tough. I don't necessarily agree with the decision, but she got the win. A win, a win is a win. Um, and uh, listen, man, she did that, and she got it out the decision after fracturing her ankle and tearing a ligament in there. So it's newfound respect right there. So I had to get that one off my chest. But in terms of our picks, right, man, it, I mean, a lot of upsets. We've been seeing a lot of A-sides killing it, doing the thing, man. But we're only going to count three fights since that's what we actually, uh, we pick those fights in advance, right? So, AJ, man, you got me. You went two for three. I went one for three, right? And the only fight we both missed on was the Felder RDA. You got Chaos Williams. In all honesty, I wish uh, we could run, see that fight get run back, man, because lasted all of 30 seconds. But listen, man. We here, it's UFC 255, a new horizon on the day, and we ready to break down some sleepers. So AJ, before we get into that, just give me uh, one big takeaway, man, from this last week's card. Man, one big takeaway from this last week, Paul Felder versus RDA. Uh, when I was rewatching it again, watching it back, I guess what stood out the most to me, Derek, was that triathlete shape and uh, wrestling shape or something, something totally different. You really see the tears in the game and Man, we were talking big game to Felder, but it showed us that RDA is serious at the 155 level, and he, he means business. Hopefully, he'll be on a, a nice run coming through. What was one takeaway for you? Listen, man, I'm going to have to agree with you. It has to be the same exact thing. I feel a little bad because of I feel like no one really gave RDA the respect that he deserves. Dude is a world beater. He's a former champ, and he showed it. He put it on display, man, because in all honesty, if you want to be generous, you can give Paul Felder a round, maybe two, you know, if we're being real about it, you know what I'm saying? RDA, he really put it on him, man, but it was a great fight nonetheless. And to see that rematch with a full camp between the two, now that would be interesting as well. But listen, the past is the past. We can't change it. We can only move on from here. So let's get into some sleepers, AJ, man. You uh, you break this one down. Start it off first. Who's your first one? Yeah, man, I love to, Derek. So my first sleeper this week, I got Kyle Dawkins again versus Dustin Stoltzfus. All right. Now I've talked about Kyle Dawkins before. He's been in the he's been in the the mix for the last couple months, right? And he's an amazing grappler, and he really showed it against Brendan Allen. He showed that he's down to also trade some leather too. He's down basically for anywhere the scrap's going to take place. He's excited and willing to take part. Now Dawkins showed his heart and his resilience in his last fight in uh, in the middle of and he was I guess what took it away from me. He was in the middle of the main card, right? And it really showed that if you lose, the UFC's ruthless and they're going to cut you down. And he's in the early prelims this fight. And, it, you know, I'm a big fan of Chael Sonnen. And, and like Uncle Chael says, position in the card is what matters. Not necessarily rank, but position the card because that's how you get paid. And once your name's on the highlight, it's all about that dollar. Exactly. So I'm hoping that Kyle Dawkins learns from his loss and kind of this slight that happened to him from the UFC. And he brings some fire to the fight. Now, Dustin Stoltzfus, I don't know if you know much about this cat, Derek, but he's uh, coming out of Germany, and he's a contender series prospect. And on first look, he's a little, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, unintimidating. He's a little He's a little, little guy, I guess, in the, in the 185 division, but he's a lot bigger and a lot stronger than he looks. Um, he, against his last fight against Pfeiffer, he was able 
to pick him up and throw him down. And not many people get their UFC contract by a slam, Derek. Most people get it by a KO knockout. But if you watch this this slam, he literally dislocates his elbow and it belongs on one of those uh, Instagram sites like like uh, Hall of Meat because it's it's disgusting and it's it's a brutal slam. And Stoltz just deserves some respect for how well he was able to execute that game plan and get him down. Um, I'm really excited to see this matchup because I really think both camps have a lot coming in and, and they're on a they're on a come up and hopefully Kyle Dawkins learns a little bit. So um, what uh, what do you think, Derek? Which which one of your sleepers? Uh, before I get into that one, man, I, I do know a little bit about your boy from Germany, man. I watched him in the Contender Series, and that slam was disgusting, right? And it is really interesting when you can earn a contract by just bringing the violence, and that is exactly what he did. But uh, my first sleeper, man, I got a couple of welterweights, man. I got a UFC vet in Alan Joe Bond, who is facing off against Jaron Gooden, who is actually making his UFC debut after picking up a lot of experience in uh, Titan FC and other regional circuits, man. So I want to talk about the B-side first. I want to talk about Jaron Gooden, man because this dude you want to talk about a like kevin holland a dude who is really like racking up fights in a short amount of time all right i got one for you man so this dude jared gooden he's had 21 fights since his ufc debut in 2015 21 he's won 17 of those fights and he took five fights in 2019 so he matched your boy kevin holland now it's a different level when you're not in the ufc of course but it's impressive nonetheless man so he's really been learning on the job man so this is going to be his third fight of 2020 and he's one of those showboaters i don't do no interviews don't talk to me i'm gonna stare you down like iron mike or like a chaos williams down the cage and he's gonna put it on you man what's really interesting about this dude is he has the capability to put you away like a chaos williams but he has some ufc or some like veteran composure already because in his last fight man had his opponent hurt backed up against the cage and instead of doing what every young fighter seems to want to do which is just pick him apart just throw a bunch of you know bombs on him he sat back calculated picked his shots finished the night man so i'm really excited to see a matchup with alan juban because a lot of people don't know about this dude he was in act he's been very inactive as of late um in 2018 man he uh he had one fight per year since 2018 because he had a couple of uh, herniated discs in his neck which is very scary as an as an athlete as a fighter right he got that taken care of uh prior to his last fight against dwight grant man and this is a dude who fights long he's gonna break you down with kicks elbows basically his kick it, it, it's kind of like a teep you know what i mean like he's kind of using it as a jab so he fights really long brings you in scraps you out with elbows and with big punches and can get you out right there man so this is why this fight's going to be interesting because both of these dudes could put each other out and like you said ufc's ruthless they're feeding alan juban uh to jared gooden who is his nickname is the night train because he's gonna put you to sleep man so that's what i got for my first sleeper what you got next aj yes I, uh sounds exciting Derek. first or next up for my sleeper i got nicholas dalby versus daniel rodriguez now let me tell you about nicholas dalby all right he's very fast a lot of lateral movement but when the punches start flying he likes to sit in the pocket and trade especially when the uh when he needs to get a little respect from his opponent and he puts the pressure on this did lead to his uh, rear naked choke loss in his last fight, but I'm expecting, you know, to brush it off, be a professional, learn from it, uh, and this time provide a little bit more of a calculated fight, all right? Now, Daniel Rodriguez, not only did he put away the body snatcher Dwight Grant in his last outing, but Rodriguez also choked out Tim Means, who we'll talk about a little later on, all right? And Rodriguez, my big takeaway from him, man, he's got the heart of the Latino culture behind him. And he's also got those stone hands that come with it, you know? So I picked this uh, fight for a sleeper because these two boys, they can crack, all right? The pressure and volume that Dalby uh, has in his, his meeting, the pressure and the power of Rodriguez, is going to make for an interesting turn -em up in the octagon. And I'm excited to see an early stoppage. What's your next sleeper? All right, man. Next, I got a couple of uh, some women's straw weights here, man. But spoiler alert, this is going to be one of my fight of the night uh, picks overall on the entire card i got number 15 ranked antonina shevchenko big sister of valentina shevchenko the champ versus ariane lipsky man and i want to let you know aj if you don't notice we already know shevchenko antonina shevchenko muay thai background kickboxing background multiple time ifma world champion in muay thai uh former k1 kickboxing champ with a 39 and 1 record we know her stand up her striking is incredible she's got a pedigree of her own 
alone. But Ariane Lipsky, man, you know what? She's a former Muay Thai champ too. You know what I'm saying? She don't play. Like these two athletes are going to come in and this is going to be one of the best fights we're going to see all year, I believe, because Lipsky, she's a three-time KSW flyweight champion, which is a top MMA organization and a former Brazilian national Muay Thai champ and Edson Barbosa and Marlon Marais also held these belts before coming into the UFC. So that's the pedigree of striking for both of these two. And what you saw in Antonina Shevchenko's last fight is that, well, who'd she fight? Caitlin Chukagin. And, uh, or maybe not the last fight, but that was against Caitlin Chukagin. She put her on the ground and she didn't allow her to use her world-class striking. Ariane Lipsky, she can hit you with a sub submission. Her last fight was won by a knee bar. But I expect to see all-out teeps, elbows, knees all day long in the center of the cage. Ariane Lipsky, one of her favorite combos is the two, three, and then switching to southpaw and hitting you with a body kick. So this is going to be, these are straw weights, dude. This is going to be nonstop action all over the cage. And worst case scenario, if someone really gets hurt, that's when I think they're going to take it to the ground. But I do just want to give um, my, my last uh, little caveat to this fight, man. Shevchenko, Antonita fights out of Tiger Muay Thai. And I tell you, I love the Muay Thais, man. And I love that gym up in Phuket specifically. But Lipsky, she trains over at King's MMA. And that's where RDA trains at. So it, it's really interesting because of how high level these fighters are. I'm going to leave it at that. This is going to be one of your fights of the night. What you got next, AJ? Derek, you're right. You got a lot of savages coming out of King's MMA, man. They make it real exciting. So next up for my third sleeper, Derek, I got Joaquin Buckley versus Jordan Wright. Now, I know what you're thinking. Joaquin Buckley. How is this dude who has potential KO of the year a sleeper fight? Well, let's look past Buckley's last performance and look at the rest of his career. And largely, it's a, his whole career is a sleeper fight. You know, that he's a sleeper fighter. Kevin Holland provided the game plan on how to beat Buckley and basically just weather the storm. And any other storm coming after that is going to be a lot softer and a lot slower. But in the KO of the year that Buckley had, he showed that his ability – to go into the deep rounds and actually hurt you when the water is, you know, uh, when you're drowning a little bit. Now, Jordan Wright, what you got to know about this kid, 11 and no, he's big, technical, and anytime you can land a spinning heel kick to open up the fight, you got my attention, all right? Now, I picked this fighter as a sleeper mainly because it's in the prelims and I wanted to give it a little bit of shine. <laughs> so, so this should be a, a crazy war that's going to end in fireworks, all right? You have Buckley who throws heat from the jump and all the confidence of a, of a cartoon network, Johnny Bravo. Now, opposite him, you have an 11-0 fighter who, is argue, who has arguably the best camp in the nation behind him and making a plan on how to weather that storm, Buckley, um, and leave there with the dub. Now, I firmly believe how you practice is how you play. And Buckley is known in St. Louis to not necessarily get along with all of his mixed martial artists, you know, which leads to him not necessarily getting the best camp in St. Louis where he's from. Now, going up against Jackson Wink camp, it's going to be a little different. And I think that's what's going to give the ability to write to make this an interesting fight going forward. And that's why I picked it as a sleeper. What do you think, Derek? What's your third? All right, man. Well, my third sleeper, honestly, it shouldn't be a sleeper. It's disrespectful to call it a sleeper, but it's a prelim and we're putting it on the sleepers. So I got in the uh, flyweight division, you know, there's some, the the title fight, we're going to see what's going to happen with that. But before that, I got number one ranked Brandon Moreno facing off against number six, Brandon Royval. Now, you know about Royval because he just made names kind of like Joaquin Buckley. He hit uh, Kai Car France with a spinning elbow craziness, crazy sprawl, got jumped up from, I'm pretty sure, unranked to number six immediately overnight it's only a second fight in the UFC now Brandon Moreno this dude man he's already been cut from the UFC so what did he decide to do uh, I'll just go win the flyweight championship in LFA no big deal they bring him back into the UFC and this dude is ready to scrap he's these two fighters are so similar they're almost identical so I have to give a little love to the UFC matchmakers because they they put a lot of fighters who have very similar kind of situations the context of their career putting them together and seeing who's going to come out on top man so Brandon Moreno and Brandon Royval are both going to be all over the cage, kind of like the fight that I talked about before, throwing a bunch of elbows, big kicks, using their Muay Thai. Uh, Brandon Royval will use the Muay Thai at least. And these dudes can both submit each other. Like, is, uh, this is such an incredible fight. I don't even want to talk about all the little analytics about it because what Brandon Royval, I'll read you some quotes. This is what I'll do, man, because obviously my mind is sporadic. Brandon Royval, this is what he feels, man. 
Uh, Moreno feels that Roy Val likes to walk forward and doesn't care about getting hit. Moreno thinks he's going to make him pay for that. Well, Roy Val, he says, I think that my BJJ is better than him. I think I can outstrike him. I think I'm an overall better fighter. So what I anticipate is in the middle of the cage, two dudes going like this, because you wanted to talk about Daniel Rodriguez and you wanted to talk about Mexican heart. Well, guess what? Brandon Moreno, if he can pull things off, will be the UFC's first full Mexican, full born Mexican, not Mexican American, Mexican champion in the UFC. Or I guess not the first because of Kane Velasquez, but Kane, AJ, does that count? Kane, he's Mexican American, is he not? I I think so, but I'm 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 forgetting where he's born, but I know he's Mexican heritage, but he might be born in America. Well, listen, Brandon Moreno, full on Mexico. This is the assassin baby, man. In terms of some intangibles, man, um, Brandon Royval is a southpaw, so this is an orthodox southpaw matchup, which is going to make it really interesting. And the last thing that I need to tell you folks is that uh, you're going to see sprawl, striking, grappling, the whole gamut. You know what I'm saying? Check it out. Fight of the night as well. I guess I forgot about this when I was announcing the last one, but this is fight of the night too. So um, that was my last sleeper. AJ, you got any more? Are you done with yours? No, sir. That's it, brother. We're on to the main card. We are on to the main card. All right, so we're going to do this one a little bit differently, folks. You know, normally we're going to break down these fights, but I want to take this a little bit big picture. We're still going to break down the fights, but first off, first matchup, we got number 14 ranked Mauricio Shogun Hua facing off against number 15 ranked Paul Craig, the Bear Jew at the light heavyweight division. And instead of AJ, us going back and forth talking about, you know, the, the intricacies of these fighters, I want to ask you a couple questions, man. So first off, context, right? Uh, Shogun Hua and Paul Craig, man, they'll be facing off for the second time. This is a rematch. You know, they fought almost a year and a week ago on the dot, and they got a majority draw. It was very anticlimactic. You know what I'm saying? Some people don't agree. Some people do agree, but it doesn't matter because they're about to do it again. So, both fighters, they had to pick up a big win. You know what I'm saying? Shogun, he beat, uh, he beat up Big Nog. And then uh, Paul Craig, he beat up Antagulov. And I think both of those have been names on this program before. So my question to you, AJ, is what do you think is going to be different in this matchup as, you know, opposed to the first one? Uh, well, Derek, I, I guess what makes it the most different compared to the first to the second is these fighters know each other now. They've had a little bit of taste of it. They know how hard each other hits. They kind of know each other's feints a little bit more. And, and then the more they're watching technique, the more it's almost becoming muscle memory for them to relive that moment and see that timing and, and get a feel for it. Um, I guess what would make the biggest difference for me in this fight coming forward would be whoever can negate the other's dominance. Um, like you said, it was a draw in the last match. And even going back and watching, it was hard to call. It was a really, it was a very technical scrap, and it's just going to be whoever's able to stop the other and maintain dominance, really. Able, if you're able to stop the shoots, or if you're able, because we know both of them want to wrestle, and we know both of them want to grapple and, and hold each other down and get the submission or ground and pound victory. But will the tenacity of the young buck be able to outcraft the veteran? Time will tell. What do you think? Well, my X factor for this fight is the ground and pound specifically, man. I think whoever has the edge in the ground and pound wins the fight. And the reason why is because both were effective in the ground and pound in the last fight, but there was no real edge. So someone is going to have to lead the dance. And in my opinion, AJ, you know, this might not be the correct opinion, but I think Paul Gregg being a little younger, right? He's 32. Shogun is 38 years old, though he has seen it all, done it all. I think Paul Craig has the, he's in the prime of, of his career, man. I think he will bring that tenacity that you speak of to get him the overall edge but i guess the biggest question here is because this is i mean 205 we just got a new champ we're seeing they want to bring up a, a middleweight champ to fight for two uh the 205 strap who benefits the most from a win here oh man i guess that's a hard one to say because if paul craig gets to this dub over shogun hua and previously especially if uh craig gets an early stoppage like he did against antagulov in round one it's almost it's almost impossible if the if the uh, Izzy fight doesn't go through to not at least give him another shot in like top five. Yeah, you know, because yeah. there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of mix em ups going on in the 205 division, and I don't know if you can give Shogun Hua a title shot or even even get him up against somebody. Wh who would you give him to? Like uh, like Lionheart. 
somebody i, I think hey, he has know, to be like, a, a gatekeeper at this point right and it's i mean listen you 38 years old that's kind of the name of the game i think at this point he needs to be the person who you know the young cats will determine whether they get a title shot whether they could beat Hua again so i think if paul craig wins he definitely deserves a shot at least in the top eight you know what i mean i definitely think mm-hmm. we should see that but um all right pick time man who are you going with me yeah I think it's uh, I I got Shogun man. I got the crafty veteran with submission round one, and I do think he is going to take on that gatekeeper position like we talked about, and and make it challenging for the rest of the division to get through him and onto better competition. Who you got? All right, man. Well, I'm going with the Bear Drew. I think that Paul Craig will be able to get it done. I think he'll be able to solve the puzzle via decision, via unanimous. Hopefully, we don't get no split decisions, start making this a you know a split draw again or whatever. But let's move on to the next one, man. So like we talked about earlier, flyweights. That's the name of the game tonight, right? We got number two, Caitlin Chukagian, facing off against number four ranked Cynthia Calvillo, man. Now, Caitlin Chukagian, dude, she's coming off of a huge loss to the former strawweight queen in uh, Jessica Andrade, where she got stopped via a body shot and lost her number one ranking to Andrade. Now, Cynthia Calvillo, on the other hand, uh, she's coming off a very impressive decision win against former flyweight ta- uh, title challenger Jessica I, right? Ranked number six right now. So being that Chukagian is a striker and Cynthia Calvillo is more of like a grappler wrestler, she's a striker as well, but more really got that grappling going on. Who do you think has the overall edge in this bout? in terms of their capabilities with their skill set, but their mind as well. Who do you think? I'm glad you added in that last part, Derek, because skill set, I would actually say Caitlin Chukagan holds the upper hand with that long striking. She does like to maintain distance and actually pick apart. And Cynthia Calvillo is not known to necessarily have the best head movement or the best body movement besides taking you down. Yeah. Now, mentally, though, I think Calvillo has the edge. Mm-hmm. Coming off that win against I versus... Chukagian getting shut down by the smaller uh, underdog in Andrade with a body shot. You got to have a little bit of, of, of hold back whenever you get stopped with a body shot by somebody who you went in there thinking they're, you know, lesser of a fighter. So I don't expect her to go into this fight thinking Calvillo's less of a fighter, but I do expect her to go in a little hungrier because of what happened last. What do you think, Derek? Well, listen, man, you said it with the body. I thought you were going to go kind of more into this, but my what I brought up for the mindset thing, if you lose via body shots, I think there's an insecurity that follows knowing that, all right, if I get touched up in my bread basket, it's going to be a long night. And if you're Cynthia Calvillo, if you're a Mexican like that, and you're saying, yo, I'm going to roll up and I'm going to beat up that bread basket, especially Calvillo throws body punches. That's not nothing new for her. So mm-hmm. I think that uh, that's the psychological edge that Calvillo will always know. Worst case, I need to resort to start beating up that body because I know she's not, I'm not going to say she's not mentally tough enough, but I do think, I mean, there's a difference when you get hit in that liver and your body just shuts down, there's nothing you can do. But there's also a mental capacity that comes into at least I'll hurt. I'm hurt, but I'm not going to show it. Chikay again, when she got hit, she was just like, oh, and turned around. And that was basically it. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but she still, I mean, like I said, she came, she's going to come back with somewhat of a vengeance. She bounced back from her loss against Shevchenko very astoundingly and beat up the big sister, Antonina. But both of these fighters, they pretty much appear to be on the brink of another title shot. Well, another one for Chikay again, but the first one for Calvillo. Now, Chikay again already had her shot. And, you know, she's trying to get another opportunity out of these two, these two fighters. Who do you think has the best shot at dethroning Valentina? Out of these two fighters to dethrone Valentina, I'm going to have to say Chukagin. Because I don't think anybody can top Valentina's wrestling. I, I also don't think anybody can top Valentina's striking. But if I had to give the upper hand to somebody, I, would, I guess I'd have to go Chukagin strictly on the length advantage. Um. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's a hard one, man. Because Valentina, we'll talk about it a little later. But that she's very dominant. She's a very dominant champ. What do you think? Who would have it? So I want to agree with you, but part of me wants to say, listen, man. Honestly, I I'll be honest, transparent. I don't think anyone could touch Valentina. I think that she is she's the Joanna uh, in Jacek of the flyweight division right now when uh, Joanna was at her prime. But I think Calvillo could make it more interesting than Chukagian could have or can still because I think Calvillo she has the uh, the ability to make things just unorthodox and nasty. You know what I mean? Get dirty boxing and just not do the conventional things so she could mess up valentina's timing 
I, I, if we're betting, if I was a betting man on this, I'd Valentino all day. But still, we have to throw that caveat out there. Now, the last question before we give our pick, do you think that the winner of this fight will have to fight Je- uh, Jessica Andrade to then determine who will get a shot at the title? Oh, definitely. 100%. I think Andrade definitely has the next shot, especially because in the women's division, everybody basically fights everybody. It's just a washing machine for everybody from 2 to 15. And now that I think that they have a little bit of extra spice with Andrade in there, I think she's going to have to be the one that takes or or one of these girls is going to have to be the one that takes her down to get back to the champ. Because I think Andrade is the one that's in line, depending on what we see later on uh, Saturday night. For sure, man. Well, we'll have to say, Calvillo, man, she's 9-1-1 one one in her entire MMA career, man. So, listen, she don't got a lot of miles on her. The future is bright. Now, what's your pick? Who are you going with? Well, Derek, I, I also think this this fight is a, is a toss-up, to be completely honest with you. And and now thinking about it, I do I do kind of agree. Calvillo is probably going to be visiting the Panaria all night long. But I'm still going to have to go Chikagian by decision. All right, right think? on, right on. Well, you know, I'm going Calvillo because of that psychological edge. Listen, man, she's going to dough up the body. Uh, the wrestling is very strong, but you can't count out Chukagian. No matter how bad the fight looked, you cannot count her out because you number one, number two for a reason. They don't just award that number for no reason, you know what I'm saying? But still, I'm going Calvillo, and I'm going with a decision win. Now, let's go next, man. This is actually one of the more exciting fights, in my opinion. I know why it's exciting for you, but listen, we got a couple of welterweights, man. We got Platinum Mike Perry facing off against the Dirty Bird and Tim Means, man. New Mexico facing off against the... uh, Mike Perry, he actually don't got a... He don't got a home base right now, man. Dude, is all over the place but the point is is he's coming in to scrap man so both mike perry and tim means they bounced back with the impressive win after uh getting stopped in their fights prior both of them got stopped so mike perry he uh got a decision win over mickey gal and tim means man he beat a young star of poli man that was very impressive to see that now, being that uh, Mike Perry, he was originally supposed to fight Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler had to pull out with a you know undisclosed injury or whatever the case may be. Uh, Perry noted that he thinks that this fight is going to actually be a lot harder because uh, Lawler, he's more of just a powerhouse in your face. Tim Means, he's more of a technical point striker, right? So who do you think has the overall striking edge in this bout? Striking edge, I think technically Tim Means is a lot more solid, whereas Mike Perry... Where he was once a brawler, he's starting to transition more to a um, a technical, kind of more of a Mike Tyson fighter where he's going to distract you but then also knock you out with a, with a third or fourth punch that's coming in. Whereas Tim means he's going to put it to you and he's going to hit you five, six, seven times. And once we're in the deeper waters, that's when he's going to be able to put you away. I would have to say, though, technically striking-wise, I'd give the advantage to Tim Means, although Mike Perry does look scary because in his interviews coming up, he's very calm. So I'm in, I'm very excited for this fight for a lot of reasons. Derek, what do you think? Well, I think the striking, I'd have to agree with you in terms of the more technical striker, of course, is Tim Means, but there's something about Mike Perry, man. In this last fight, when everyone betted against him because his corner was his girlfriend, man, it was just random, right? This dude came in and he was dropping, he was dropping bombs, man, and he carried his gas tank over, which was really, it just goes to tell me that he's focused, man. It might not seem like it, but it really appears that he's focused in this odd, dysfunctional way. So I'm going to go with Perry being the more dangerous striker. But Tim Means being the more calculated, safer striker who is going to put you away with volume. Now, back to the corner situation, we have to talk about it because, you know, it's pretty much what is the you know most talked about about this card, one of the most things. But for Platinum, man, he's saying that it's, it's Platinum Martial Arts, baby. We do it on our own. I got my lady in the corner for moral support. Um, let me ask you this, though, man. Can Mike Perry continue putting wins together without having professionals in his corner who can give him advice and adjustments on the fly? Tim Means isn't isn't an opponent like a Mickey Gall where you're just going to walk down this dude. You know what I'm saying? Like this dude's got experience. You're going to need to adjust because he's going to be making adjustments. Do you think this success is sustainable? Uh, at, At the moment, ironically, I do a little bit with Mike Perry. He was he was training out of Albuquerque, he was training out of Jackson Wink and he was able to take some of that knowledge he had whatever happened with the split he left and he's been able to show it's I at first asking 2 weeks ago Derek and I would have said no chance. I would have said Mike uh when he had all that stuff even going on Darren Till talking about his corner and blah 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 5 grand. No chance would I have said that, but 
Man, Mike Perry, something in this last week of interviews has really impressed me with his callousness and with his how calm he's taking everything and actually looking like a professional. Um, and I think not having that distraction of somebody who Mike Perry thinks he's supposed to listen to, supposed to look up to and then listen from, and then when he's in the fight, he hears something like, punch him in the face, and he thinks to himself, no shit. <laughs> I think that was the distraction for him, whereas in this option, he's – doesn't need to listen to anybody outside except for when his girl comes up and, and like says something like, yeah, you did it. Or, you know, whatever right. that little quote is. I, that's It's a hard one though because that can be a distraction. Nobody wants to get beat up in front of their girl. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I've contemplated over this a lot. And like I said, there's like a dysfunctional focus that I'm seeing out of him. Like you're saying, this calmness that just tells me he's ready to go to war, you know, for real, for real. But at the same time, he has so much out of the ring stuff going on and drama going on. It's hard for me to really tell. Is it focus or is it avoiding problems? I don't know. Dude just had to go to like a, uh, you know, it's not, listen, this is, we don't even need to talk about all the out of the cage stuff, man. But the point is, is dude's had some problems that he's had to shore up and it'll be interesting to see. Now, my last question is, Tim Means, dude, he's he's blue-collar, no nonsense, man. What does a win at 170 do for Tim Means? <laughs> blue-collar, no nonsense, Derek. Tim Means, man, I don't know if you know much about his past, but that boy used to be into, into heroin and shit, man. Yeah. He's crazy. So, But this is now, the veteran. This is the veteran Tim Means. This is the OG, man. You watch his interviews, and it's very much like, oh, we ain't about that no more. You feel me? He, and that's what I was about to say is yeah. he's now transformed. So he still has that dog in him. And I guess you are correct when you say a little more blue collar and a little more professional because he does hold himself to a higher standard as a martial artist. Man, Oh, man, Tim Means, what does this mean for him? I think it puts him back on that because he is a crafty veteran. And I don't want to say he's a gatekeeper because in the 170-pound division, it's not necessarily completely stacked with talent like the 155 is. He can still make a name for himself, and he can still make a run, especially with Adesanya wanting – or, I mean, not Adesanya wanting to move up. Um, I just blanked the champ's name. It's Usman at 170. Usman. Yeah. yeah, Usman. Usman and Burns and all that stuff going on especially with Leon Edwards and Shemaev, Tim Means has a spot to make a name, especially with shutting somebody down, like a hype train of Mike Perry. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting to see for the future of Tim Means when he's had such a crazy past and such a long time in the UFC. I mean, 43 fights. You know, he's, he's been here for quite a while. What do you think? Well, man, I think that Tim Me, in all honesty, man, listen, he doesn't carry a rank right now. So if anything, get him closer to being back in that top 15 and maybe challenging for those fights. But I think he'd have to string maybe a, a couple good ones together in a row, man, because as it sits right now, he's three and two in his last five and he got finished in his last five. And there's nobody who's getting finished in their last five that's really making noise right now. So um, with that being said, man, I'm going Tim Means. I'm going by decision just because of the veteran craftiness, because of having a real deal team and a corner and all that stuff i know i bet against mike perry last time and he proved me wrong but we'll see if he could pass this test all right then we're talking who are you going with aj yeah derek i have to agree with you i'm going tim means by decision yeah i'll go decision as well on that man so listen that we, we got a little into the outer the ring stuff. Let's get back to it, man. We had the co-main. We ready for a scrap. In all honesty, this could be a UFC pay-per-view all by itself. We got the flyaway queen, Valentina Shevchenko, facing off against Jennifer Maya, number three ranked, fighting out of uh, Shoot the Box in Brazil, you know, with Monstro. That's the Monstro's gym. So Shevchenko, man, she's been an absolute force since gaining the flyweight uh, title. She fought it versus Joanna Jacek and won it in a vacant class, right? Um, she's defended the strap three times, and she He's finished the challenger out of two of those three fights, man. Shevchenko and Maya, they have two similar opponents in their last five, which would be Caitlin Chikagian and Liz Carmouche. Now, Shevchenko beat both of them, and Maya lost to both of them. So my question to you, man, is Jennifer Maya, her biggest wins have come against Roxanne Modafferi and Joanne Calderwood, which was a very last-second thing, man. This is only her fifth, her fifth time stepping into the UFC octagon. Do you think she's ready for Valentina? Like, has she even earned this shot, really? It's an honest question. It's 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 an honest question, and it's actually a very fair question, Derek, because would do I think she's earned it in the history of the run? Not necessarily. She hasn't really had any notable victories besides her last victory, and, and thankfully for her, the UFC is a, a business of what have you done for me lately. And with her early armbar of Calderwood, which was impressive— 
I kind of think that they just had to throw somebody to the wolves, and it was it was that it was uh, Jennifer Maya's time to be eaten, you know. And and Shevchenko, she's just too good. I, it's hard, it's hard. But then every puncher has a chance, so we can't completely count her out. Yeah, it's I don't I don't really think she does. To be honest with you, though, what do so, you think? So that's how I feel, man. I don't think that she. I think that there's other other. I honestly, Calvillo, man, I think that she deserves a shot before Jennifer Maya. You know what I'm saying? But the reason why is because, like I said, man. I mean, I know Roxanne Modafari is a legend of the sport, man. But I don't. I count that as like a, a kind of a gatekeeper fight, but not really. Like Modafari is not challenging for a title in the UFC right now. I don't know, man. I think that uh, this is definitely Jennifer Maya being fed to the wolves, but obviously you know big risk big reward man so she has an opportunity to make history so that's another one of the questions that i have for you if maya pulls off this win is this the biggest upset that we've seen in recent history definitely that comes to recent mind um if man if maya gets the win especially an early win that would make some serious noise and man be, russia might revolt because that would be that would be crazy so I guess this is the last question before the pick, man. Can Jennifer Maya do to Valentina Shevchenko what Caitlin Chukagian did to Antonina Shevchenko, which is absolutely stuff her offensive game on the stand-up, control her, and ground and pound for a win? You know, Maya's not really a ground and pound fighter. If anything, she's going to try to submit you. She's a grappler. But do you think it's even, what's the realm of possibility? One to 10, how confident are you that she has an opportunity to pull that off? One to 10, how confident am I that Maya can duck under, get a hold of Shevchenko, hold her against the fence, take down, work a submission? Man, it is her skill and it is, if, if you're able to put somebody on their back that hasn't even come close to getting put on their back in quite a long time, it, it, some crazier things have happened, Derek. So I'm going to say a four. Okay. I'm going to go with a four. A little bit more than I initially would have, but crazier things have happened in the UFC and and – it's it's we've seen crazier you know so what, what do you think what'd you say one ten i'm going three and the reason why is i just believe too much in valentina's her balance being a dancer right she's like so i don't know what kind of dance she was doing some type of like russian dance or whatever but she has a lot of balance kind of like a, a lomachenko style right and her muay thai man her muay thai and her kickboxing is undeniable you see it her timing is impeccable all she needs is she needs less than a round to figure you out and to determine how she's going to get you out of there man she's one of the female fighters that's not an absolute powerhouse like a Jessica Andrade that is constantly finishing her opponents like it's not even a question so I'm going Valentina Shevchenko in this fight third round knockout what are you going AJ man Derek hit the nail on the head I got the exact same thing Shevchenko KO round three I firmly believe that if you would clone Valentina Shevchenko her fighting style you could really take over the world man she's very impressive and I think she's only going to put her away in three just to be nice <laughs> yeah right don't let her suffer man get her out of there she got things to do that night so man here we are we had a main event man so this is we got a world beater on our hands versus uh an interesting prospect coming up so we got the champ davison figueredo is facing off against number four ranked alex perez in the flyweight men's division 125 pounds man so let me set this up man davison figueredo looked like an absolute world-class world beater since his last loss in early uh, 2019 man what difference a year can make man so figueredo and perez they have two similar opponents in their last five and this is where it's interesting man it's juicy uh, Formiga and Joseph Benavidez. Now, Figueredo, he finished Benavidez twice, but lost a decision to Juicy Formiga. Now, Alex Perez, he finished Formiga, but he got finished by Benavidez. So that's really telling in and of itself, just in who they're fight they're fighting these similar opponents and all that, right? So Alex Perez, I said it from the jump, he's a Dana White Contender Series alumni. They're trying to really hype that up and uh, and make it you know something bigger than it is. But we have to give context. Uh, Figueroa was supposed to fight Cody Garbrandt, right? Cody Garbrandt, he actually had to pull out due to a torn bicep. So Alex Perez gets the shot man and what was his last fight on versus formigo where he stopped him very impressive with leg kicks but that was an early prelim aj that wasn't even a prelim so he's going from the headlining of the early prelims to a main event slot fighting for the title it's actually incredible how that works and this is another one of those cases where i have to ask you man does Perez earn, like, has he earned this shot for this title? Do you think out of all the people who could have stepped up and challenged for the title, Alex Perez should be the name? 
Well, I mean, he is number Alex Perez is number four, and his win against Juicy Formiga was very impressive. I, I don't know if he tore his AC, if he tore Formiga's ACL, but it definitely looked like it because yeah. that was rough. Now, has he earned it? Per his clout and his fight history, uh, maybe. But taking a taking a early contract sign and jumping in when the boss knocks on the door, anybody I think earns it if you're willing to go against a world beater like Davison Figueroa, because he is killing it in his last fights, man. They, being able to stop Benavidez twice, one by a ground and pound, right cross to a ground and pound in round two, and then choke him out in round one. And if you watch that last fight against Benavides, most most people tap to a uh, to a rear naked choke just because it's time to tap and they're yeah. they've lost they they quit mentally not Benavides you go to sleep he, he's that kind of fighter man you got to put him to sleep and he was out for a good ten minutes because Figueredo had to put him out man and and, and Figueredo is just a, a complete world destroyer right now and it's exciting to see what do you think did he earn it did Perez earn it so listen man while I think that his last fight was super duper impressive dude got pop on his shots I'm talking about Alex Perez Perez got real pop on his shots man he's not afraid to walk forward and put it on you. But have you seen a Figueredo fight, man? Like, Figueredo, that's all, that's his career. He's a knockout artist in the 125-pound division, and he's finally figuring out he's got to get that grappling going to be well-rounded, to really be and fulfill that role of the champion. But in terms of power, I think his power is unmatched in the 125-pound division. I think Alex Perez got the shot because when opportunity and preparation, you know, when that, when that time comes and all that comes together, man, you get an opportunity to make something amazing happen like a Jennifer Maya. But that's... So, no, I don't think he earned it for a long answer for that. But my next question to you is, I already said my opinion. Do you agree that Davison Figueredo is the hardest hitter in that entire division? Is there anybody that can even come close to matching his power? Man, that's that's the interesting thing about these lightweight divisions, Derek. The 125, the 135-pound division, all the fighters are basically very similar. They're almost the same, except for that one X factor like you're talking about. Power. Figueroa can crack, all right? Most other 125ers, it's all volume shots and it's all peppering you. Now, is he the biggest cracker in 125? I think Cody Garbrandt might have him, but... I'd say it's a it's a maybe Figueredo wins six out of ten, whereas Cody Garbrandt would get the four. You know, it's it's very very close, but he's right there in the competition. And then we got to think about right, Cody Garbrandt. He's coming down from one thirty five, so it's like I guess he could slide into that conversation, but he's not like a natural one twenty five er. But listen, man, I think Alex Perez, where he is at his best, where he's most impressive, is in the stand up and the striking. And unfortunately, I don't think that game plan works against Figueredo. I think the game plan, which Juicy A Formiga showed us already, the way to beat. Uh, Figueredo is to put him on his back. Why? Because oftentimes, man, he honestly won't try to get up. What he'll try to do is just attack off his back, which is super fire, man. But in all honesty, you have to get up back to your feet if you know that's not your strong suit. Over over the course of five rounds, we just saw Paul Felder RDA. You know, when one dude wants to beat you up on the feet and is cracking you and you don't want that, you just take him to the ground and that's it. If you got the ability to keep him there. So being, you know, with that being said, man, what is Perez's best chance of winning this fight, in your opinion? I think his, his, his best chance of winning this fight is exactly like you said, Derek. Get on the inside, take him to his back, let him think that controlling or sh attacking from the bottom is cool, is, is okay, and it's how to win the fight. Because in the, judges, in the eyes of the judges, even if you are the champ, if you're still in the bottom, we saw what happened to, um, oh man, I just blanked the name. Um, Who we got? The Who last... We got? Uh, the 135 champ. He was on uh, Max Holloway. If you're if you're willing to just sit back and relax and not let the pressure take on, um, and he got he got that'd two decision a, losses to Volkov. That'll be a 145. That 145 is Holloway. 135 is uh, Piotr Jan right now. Yeah, yeah, that's not the. I was thinking of Max Holloway. Excuse yeah, me, the 145 right on. because he stayed back and was able just to let his opponent dictate the pace of the fight. That's what lost in the fight in the eyes of the judges. And I think if you're going to keep both of your shoulders on the mat, like Figueredo has been known to do, you're going to end up losing the decision. What yeah. do you think? Well, I mean, in all honesty, yeah, like I said, that has to be the guess, the best game plan. But there's one other option too, and it's what we saw against Formiga. You know, beat up the legs. 
If you just spam those leg kicks, man, with the pop that Perez has, and he could immobilize Figueredo, then you can use your actual skill set, which is to start beating him up on, on the top, right? But he's also a grappler. He's a wrestler. You know what I'm saying? He has the capability to do something. It's just a matter of can you actually do it? Everyone got the skill set. Can you implement your game plan and your skill set? So uh, final pick, man, who you got in this one? Man, in this one, Derek, I'm going Figueredo, but I'm actually going Figueredo by decision. What do you think? You know, at first, I was going to just do across the board, Valentino, KO3, or Valentina, KO3, Figueredo, KO3, but I agree with you as well, man. I think Perez, listen, when you're hungry, man, and you're really like, you don't know if you're going to get this opportunity again, right? Because like I said, it's kind of unprecedented. I didn't, I didn't really think that he should get this shot, but hey, if he could prove me wrong, if he can go in there and make some noise and actually get that strap that'll be that'll be risk you know is definitely worth that reward man but the risk is also you getting put to sleep you know what i'm saying figueredo don't play that so i'm going figueredo decision man and that rounds up man we gave them the picks we gave them the sleepers we talked about some recap we did the whole nine to one last thing to round this whole thing out aj is give me your prediction for fight of the night fight of the night there my fight of the night personally I got Brandon Moreno versus uh, Brandon Roy Ball. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the scrap, man. What, what do you think? I know you gave me two, but if you had to pick one, what would you say? So that's exactly what I was going to say, man. If I really had to pick one, man, it'd be easy to go with that one because I, I, I think that's going to be a great fight nonetheless. But I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm going Antonina Shevchenko versus Ariane Lipsky because you have two of the most world-class strikers you will see put in an octagon together, man. The, the credentials of those two fighters is legitimately incredible and i guess i'll caveat it for the women's division you know what i'm saying for the women's divisions it's hard to find strikers that world class so that's you know that's gonna be it man aj do you have any last words for this episode of all factors considered mm, nothing comes to mind Derek. just i love being here again man thanks for having me on i right look on. forward to saturday Yes, sir. So listen, man, fight fans, let us know who you pick in the comment section below. We pose a lot of questions here, man. So also, if you if you feel a little bit differently than us, man, let us know. You know what I'm saying? Let's see if you know a little bit better than us. But at the end of the day, we gave you the fights to watch out for. All of them were prelim. So go check them out. You know what I'm saying? And uh, with that being said, man, that's it for us. Until next time, folks. Peace.